Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, technology. and particularly the bits in between. Welcome to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. The podcast that covers all things about humans, technology, and particularly the bit in between. With your host, Barry Kirby. Welcome to this episode of the Human Factors Podcast. Just before we get in, I get into introducing uh, my guest for today. There's been a couple of things that have gone on that have been really um, quite quite brilliant for this podcast. Um, there has been the ergonomics conference that, that went on and that went online uh, with the Chartered Institute and that was a, a, a big success. But one of the things that happened there was we found that the, the podcast had been actually nominated for in the communications award. Now, whilst we didn't win, I was um, really uh, pleased to get to be awarded a certificate of a uh, highly commended it in that. So for any, anybody and everybody who's involved in, um, in that, I would just like to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for putting us forward. That was brilliant. But without further ado, um, I would like to um, introduce the topic. We're going to be talking about um, just culture today. We brought in an expert, and that is uh, James Hayton. James, welcome. Thanks, Barry. Thanks for having me on. No, not a problem at all. Now, James, you're the Human Factors and Safety Culture Lead at Bain Simmons. Yeah, right? that's right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So that's an awfully long title. Could you? What does it mean? <laughs> what, do you, what is it you do? Well, um, I work for um, a consultancy, Bain Simmons. Um, they have a, a number of different areas that they uh, they consult on and they, they deliver training. And um, yeah, I, I arrived in the company and worked specifically with defence initially, um, delivering some training programmes for defence, mainly focused on, on human factors and how we can use human factors, specifically looking at error management, how to reduce errors, how to understand why errors are happening within organisations. So that was um, a lot of my focus. Um, but obviously tied in with that, we, we also look at culture, in particular just culture, but, but safety cultures generally. How are organisations set up? What is the culture within an organisation? And how does that lead to uh, better outcomes, better safety outcomes? Um, so, yeah, that's another area I look at. On top of that, I also do a little bit looking at risk and the links with risk and risk management. So by the sounds like you get really stuck into the um, almost the really serious end of, of the human factor spectrum. You deal with them, um, them really small numbers out of really complex models. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it definitely feels like it's the, the sharp and pointy end of it is, um, you know, it's people doing their day to day jobs uh, and really seeing them. Uh, not only at their best when they're getting the most out of it, but when things go wrong. So we spend an awful lot of time focusing on that, um, looking at investigations. Uh, how do we find out what's going wrong in the real world and, and try to improve the outcomes, try to stop them happening again? Yeah. Um, no, no, and and the, the, the follow on from that, and we'll, we'll get into this in a second, so I'm, I'm not going to preempt some of my questions here, mm -hmm. but it's quite a serious bit of work that you get into. How do you get into human factors in the first place? How, what, what, was the, uh, what was the career path? Well, I think my first thoughts about it, not, not as a discipline, uh, but when, it was, uh, when I was um, going through my uh, engineering degree at university in the early 90s, okay. some of the design things that we were asked to do as uh, um, projects, part of my, my degree programme, and uh, there's a couple of one in particular I remember where I'd been marked down um, uh, and I went in to discuss it with the tutor and the tutor said, oh, well, you, you did such and such during this design. I said, yeah, well, the guy's got to maintain it. Oh, no, no, no. You, you overcomplicated the problem there. Uh, and I said, well, surely when you're looking at the design, it's not just whether it works or not. It's somebody's got to look after it and maintain it. Oh, yeah, you're making it too complicated. So it, it, I found it a little bit annoying. They're obviously trying to have a, a simple uh, design. Um, uh, basically, it's a little project just to check your design thinking. But part yeah. of my design thinking right then, right in those early days, was uh, was thinking about the, the user and the maintainer of it, uh, which the university wasn't interested in. Uh, right. uh, and that really irritated me. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> kind of stuck with me for quite a while. So um, I, I, when my sort of career progressed and I got into uh, working in the military, I, I thought that sort of thinking about your users, thinking about the people in the real world was just part of 
of good management really but it turns out there's more to it than just just good management yeah so yeah i started at university with engineering and um, i took my engineering degree with me into uh, initially the royal navy um, i wanted to be a pilot so i wasn't thinking about human facts at all I just wanted to fly airplanes yeah yeah and um yeah through through various uh decisions and perhaps not all decisions that i made I ended up in um, in marine engineering, which really wasn't striking a chord with me. I did, I, I did that for a couple of years, yeah. um, and then jumped ship to um, to go and work in the Royal Air Force in in the um, late nineties. Uh, well, that's, I mean, that's a big jump because I mean certainly then going cross service is, was was not a usual uh, a usual everyday thing, was it? Yeah, it's starting to get more common nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but at the time, there's a few of us that did it, but not many. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, the uh, certainly going from the bowels of a ship to um, <laughs> looking at designing aeroplanes or engineering and maintaining aeroplanes was was a bit of a jump. But that's what I always wanted to do anyway, is work in aviation. So it was supposed to be aviation in the Royal Navy. And I changed to uh, to a different uniform, changed to a light blue suit instead of a dark blue. And um, yeah, and picked up kind of where I left off with the Navy. Brilliant. So then you... Um finish your time with the um finish time with the air force you then yeah. jump to civilian domain mm -hmm. um what was it how did you find that jump how did you find that uh, going into the civilian workspace well i'd spent quite a bit of time as you go higher up in the military um you spend uh probably you go through a number of different jobs certainly as uh, i was a, an engineer officer so i spent an awful lot of time working alongside industry anyway yeah um, as you go up dealing with uh, defense equipment and support and things like that. So working directly with companies like Rolls-Royce and, and um, at the time Westland Helicopters and Augusta and, uh, organizations like that that I'd been working with. So it wasn't a massive leap for, for me as an engineer. I think perhaps some of the aircrew and people like that, it, it does feel a big leap because they probably don't get exposed to um, uh, the contractors in quite the same way. Obviously, some do. Um, so, yeah, it didn't feel like a massive leap. Um, and, um, yeah, I took a lot of my background with helicopters, um, unmanned air systems or drones, whatever you want to call them, uh, fast jets, things like that. So I took that with me across into um, uh, initially my own company um, dealing with human factors. Um, we've kind of jumped a little bit of the human factors journeys, which we should go back to, shouldn't we? But, um, yeah, I, I took some of that into my own company and working with Bain Simmons as a as an associate consultant. So I didn't okay. work full time, I just worked for them part time. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and then did some other jobs uh, under my uh, own steam, looking at cockpit design and um, other military equipment design before going back to Bain Simmons as a full time employee as a safety consultant. Oh, brilliant. Okay. So that, that's taking you on a real, um, it's almost a roller coaster in many ways, going to yeah. service and then straight into, um, um, into industry and worked at that way. What why did you decide to become um, a consultant in your own right? You know, so it's basically start up your own company. Did you find that an easy thing to do or? Um... Uh, no, I think we do the classic um, servicemen leaving the uh, the military. You, you, you've been institutionalized for 20 years and it's, oh, what do I do now? And uh, <laughs> I, did, I did a little bit of traveling when I, I first left, but um, went around South America with my um, uh, then wife now, uh, then girlfriend, now wife. Um, but um, yeah, we kind of, you're sort of tasting the ground a little bit, you know, sort of um, putting feelers out and trying to decide what to do. And you yeah. do something for a bit and go, yeah, I'm not sure that's it yet. And so, yeah, I spent a couple of years sort of trying different things and then realised well, actually I quite enjoyed the the teaching and the consulting and, and went back to perhaps a more stable base in, in, uh, in Bain Simmons because it's a well-established consultancy. Yeah, yeah. So... You obviously came when you came out of the RAF. You came, um, you jumped into into the human factors domain as a uh, as, as a fully fledged human factors uh, uh, consultant. Um, why jump back into human factors, given that you've done such a broad stretch? Because I believe you're a chartered engineer as well. Yeah, so yeah, I was a BNG uh, and uh, a chartered as a CNG, chartered engineer while I was in the military, and then. Um, one of the things that um, I did while I was um, probably midway through my my military career was start studying psychology because it interested me. Yeah. Uh, purely out of the blue, just decided to do an A level in psychology, which then followed on with a degree in psychology, which um, 
certainly in some of the fields of error management, actually is quite unusual. Uh, a lot of this sort of forward facing stuff of human factors. Uh, uh, yeah, having this sort of a sound psychology background, a degree in psychology is, is, is not that usual, actually. Uh, and then an MSc in, in applying sort of psychology and human factors in, in specifically at aero systems and looking at safety and, and, and risk management in aero systems with my MSc. So there was a point where I had a full time job. I was doing a, a, a psychology degree and an MSc. I wouldn't recommend it. That, <laughs> it's, a, that's just, it's a good way yeah. to burn all your life away. <laughs> that's a very, very keen approach. <laughs> but, um, but no, that's, br that's brilliant. Um, so you're in Bain Simmons now and doing what you do. We, the, the main thing we're going to talk about today then is this idea of, um, of just culture. Now, we hear about a lot, a lot about culture at the moment. Uh, lots of there's different types of culture. Look, it's got much more prominence than than I think it ever has. Um, so, if we're going to focus on just culture, what is just culture? Well, my first engagement with it was um, uh, following um, the accident that happened to the Royal Air Force uh, in 2006. The um, uh, they lost a the Nimrod. Um, not to enemy action. It was a, um, a an accident that that happened um, that was pinned to the organisational culture, uh, and, and it wasn't just focusing on the RAF. It was looking across sort of defence aviation, and um, uh, there was a report conducted by QC Charles Haddon Cave, um, which was pretty instrumental to the military and, and changed a lot of the way they do aviation safety uh, and one of the key focuses in that report was was on safety culture and uh, it was something I was interested in and something that um, uh, I'd read a lot about previously in the works of James Reason and one of the key elements of a safety culture is this thing called a just culture and um, this what we're talking about really is, is a balance it, it's, it's a balance between a, a, a blame culture and a no blame culture uh, and neither of those are particularly helpful for an organization what do i mean by a blame culture is where people's errors their mistakes their unsafe acts if you like that they may do in the workplace are just indiscriminately punished so we're just going to blame somebody we'll punish them for it yeah. without really understanding why they happened uh, and digging deeper uh, and obviously, the no blame culture is the other the other extreme. Is is all right? Okay, uh, everybody's got sort of carte blanche, uh, blanket immunity. Doesn't matter what their actions are, uh, and that's not good for an organisation either. So we want to strike a balance between those two elements, and and that's what is referred to as a a just culture. Okay, so I mean, so in layman's terms, so I understand it, it's about being using. Um, I won't blame it in, in an appropriate way. So, you know, not too much, not too little, um, trying to hit a sweet spot. Would that be right? Yeah, yeah, exactly that. It's about being fair to the staff, um, the people that work in your organisation. It's treating them fairly, not just yeah. instantly rushing to blame. Uh, and also providing a sort of a, a, an environment in which they feel sort of psychologically safe to talk about some of their issues, you know, what is going on at work? What's going wrong at work? Why are you having difficulty complying with the rules? Why do you not have the equipment that you need? And they need to be in a position where they feel they're capable of talking about that. So, so that's what we're trying to get to. So we can understand why things are going wrong in the organization. If we just run straight to blame, then that, that whole um, uh, mine of information dries up because people just become frightened, they hide, they don't talk about their problems. And as a result, as an organisation, it makes that continuous improvement difficult. So how does that fit then with this idea that, you know, it's human nature that we want to, like something goes wrong, we want to blame somebody for it. Somebody's got to hang, somebody's got to, um, you know, somebody's got to lose their job because of, um, because, because of what's happened, if it's something that's particularly serious. Um, we see it in, in, I think, all domains. I think, don't we? So, like, politics is a great example where something goes wrong. We immediately want the minister sacked. Um, they might not have even had any idea about what was going on, but we want somebody, a figurehead, to um, to be binned. Um, a manager should go because something's happened. So, where do, how do we get that balance right between um, almost 
to fulfill that human nature, that human need to see justice done. Um, but also, or uh, with that idea about, um, as you as you say, diving into a, um, an issue to actually get the best out of it. Well, there are a number of things that we need to um, uh, need to look at. We we can work with an organisation to look at, you know, what are their processes? Uh, how do you deal with people? What's your disciplinary policy? And we we can talk about that in a bit more depth later on. But we also want to talk about what we'll really sort of challenge some of the mindset of the organisation of why do you do that? And we again, as we go further on with this discussion, we can delve into a bit of the sort of psychology of this natural intention to blame but it's very much a, a, a an emotional response as opposed to a rational response so uh, yeah we're, we're driven by our our biases and, and our sort of immediate emotions yeah. uh, and that drives us to 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 want to blame uh, and one of the things that we find is apart from the fact it's emotionally satisfying it's quite nice to point the finger at people and it seems a bit mean, but when something's gone wrong and, and perhaps if you're in charge, it, it's a bit of a shortcut. We like to just point the finger at that particular individual and say, well, you know, they were the issue. Um, it, it can appease corporate guilt as well as an organisation. Perhaps there's a bit of embarrassment as an organisation that we've had an accident. Therefore, heads will roll. We've yeah. made heads roll. We've got rid of those culpable individuals. As an organisation, we're safe again. Um, uh, but again, that's really not digging very deep and it, it's been very superficial. Uh, and obviously, public outrage when there's been particularly there's been fatal accidents, people have been killed or, or, or seriously injured um, or heaven forbid, uh, vulnerable groups like children have been involved. And you can think back to things like the baby pee scandal and things like that. Yeah. The red top papers are outraged. You know, as soon as the the um, parents had been convicted in that particular case, the first thing the papers were banging for was is blood in within Haringey Council um, child services, for example. They're banging for blood, and the public gets sort of wrapped it up in it. And that sells newspapers. You know, getting people engaged in that emotional um, sort of witch hunt, if you like. Um, but it doesn't really help us understand why it happened. Um, and just blaming those involved often he's focusing on a symptom rather than the deeper causes. Uh, uh, and sometimes it can come back and bite us because we, we end up having to um, um, pay out in tribunals and compensation claims for firing people who really um, uh, were, were perhaps not to blame at all. And obviously as an organisation, we really haven't learned anything. So you kind of brush the real underlying reasons under the carpet. That's really, yeah. The I remember seeing... Um... Charles Hangate give the one of the keynotes at the Ergonomics Conference in our plucky year 2013, maybe later, I can't remember. Uh, but anyway, I, it was one of them, them keynotes where I thought he was brilliant because he um, he refused to use PowerPoint slides. Um, and he just, he, 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 he entreated us that if we were a good audience, then we might get treated to a PowerPoint slide or two. <laughs> and whilst it was a very lighthearted way of looking at it, his point, I think, was really good that they um that the the Nimrod disaster had so focused on the paperwork being right but the but the paperwork didn't necessarily um reflect what the true part of life was um that I, I that he really got that powerful message across um do you think we've do you think we've learned from that i mean not just on the military but actually as a whole um that the pay that the, the whole this whole idea of safety case is more than just a more than just a piece of paper yeah, I mean, it's become a bit of a mantra in Bain Simmons is that, that people do safety, processes, procedures don't. Um, right. And people often get tired in making sure they've got the policy. And actually, it's a big issue often with just culture is we go into many organisations and they think they've got a just culture. Uh, and what they mean is that we've written a policy on it. But when you do a bit of digging and start asking the staff, the staff don't really understand it. They okay. don't know where... Uh, the balance is between, well, I'm not entirely sure how I'll be dealt with. I'm not sure what is acceptable, what's unacceptable. If I own up to this, will I get punished or not? I'm not sure. Um, or we might even find that they've done part of the job, they've written the policy and nobody actually spoke to HR about it. So it doesn't really align with the disciplinary policy. So they've kind of done half of the paperwork. So, yeah, the, this, it's really the people that are are constantly finding errors in your system and they're coming up with workarounds but you want to give them the opportunity to tell you where your system is broken. 
Um, and without a just culture, they're probably not going to do that. They're probably going to keep their hands in their pockets. They're going to keep their mouth shut. And if they make a mistake, they'll cover the tracks because they're worried they're going to get punished for it. So it's the people that do safety, not not the process and procedures. But we do need to give them the opportunity to tell us about what's going wrong in the organisation. You are listening to 1202, the Human Factors podcast. We wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you for your support. You can help further by rating us through your podcast provider, sharing us through social media, and telling your friends and colleagues. Let's work together in raising awareness of the value in putting users at the center of what we do. So for a business then, um, if I'm senior manager in a large organization, then um, where's the value to, is there, is there examples or ideas, um, yeah, exa- examples out there where having a just culture could basically financially reward the company, the company's better off for doing it? Yeah, um, as um, we frequently don't like to talk about specific organisations yeah. that are doing uh, just culture because um, sometimes it can be a bit embarrassing for them. But actually, uh, yeah, we weren't very just before. We, we didn't treat our staff very fairly. But some of the things... Yeah, exactly. So, so some of the things that that come out of it. Well, the first thing is is actually it, it's good for recruitment and retention as an organisation because if you're starting to treat your staff fairly and giving them the opportunity to speak up, and you listen to your staff and you fix the problems that they're seeing on their day to day, you know, in their day to day work, uh, and the problems that they're constantly trying to work around, then actually it becomes a really enjoyable place to work, and yeah. you feel psychologically safe. You you see continuous improvement. So actually, it's great for retention and um, uh, and for recruitment. It's a positive. Um, but if you're making those continuous improvements, what it means is you're learning about what's going wrong. So you're reducing the amount of rework, perhaps, that your organization is doing. What's going wrong in our, in our business that's costing us money? So from a business perspective, it, it can really affect the bottom line. You, you can really make some significant improvements there. Plus, you know, as I said earlier on, if you are indiscriminately blaming people, things can come back and bite you and, and cost you money in, in that regard as well. And it's quite an interesting, interesting case that James Reason t- used to talk about um, in America, where he worked with two hospitals that were trying to implement a just culture. And um, yeah, the, the hospital said, well, OK, we'll give it a whirl. But if our doctors start owning up to errors they've made, the litigation is going to go through the roof. And obviously in the USA, quite a lit- uh, litigious culture. So the hospital sort of banked up their, their funds ready for all this litigation. And they found actually the reverse happened, which puzzled everybody involved. But what they found is when they went back to the patients and said, we, we made a mistake, we know what we've done wrong, we apologise, we can put it right, is those patients used to say to their legal team, right, you can stand down, I just want to go back to this hospital. Um, recently, somebody bumped into my car and, and drove off without um, without letting me know. That winds me up a lot. And, and you, know, you want to, you want to um, blame a person. Yeah. But, but if they'd come in and spoke to me and said, oh, sorry, we've had this accident, then your res- your response to that is very different uh, and that's what we're really sort of trying to get around uh, uh, and some of the sort of things that come from that is you have a different emotional response to when people own up to things and it gives you the opportunity to to learn and improve so there's got to be a fair amount of of trust involved in this i guess from um as a, inside the corporation inside the organization as a whole um and as we know trust isn't an easy thing to to build so i guess that's an entire process the first step on this surely has got to be is i try and how do how do i identify if i've got a just organization or not how do i how, how do i evaluate myself well I, I think that's that's um a, a, a great question um trust in itself is is perhaps uh, I think even James Reason said a just culture could very easily be called a trust culture, and that's definitely my view. Um, number one, the the management, that, well, primarily the staff need to trust management aren't going to indiscriminately blame them. And um, also the management need to trust the staff will raise their hand and talk about the issue. So trust goes both ways. Uh, and I was listening to um, uh, Toto Wolf of Mercedes 
uh, recently, and um, he very, very nicely said that trust is not a talking game; it's a behaviour game. Yeah. You don't build trust by telling people to trust you; you build trust by demonstrating the behaviours. So that's the first thing that you really want to be looking at as an organisation: is is uh, well, what are your behaviours? How are you making yourself consistent when errors happen? How are you consistent in applying that? Because obviously different managers have different ideas of what is fair and what is not fair. Yeah. So um, to build trust, you need to be consistent. You need to be consistent with the staff and, and uh, as they sort of start to build confidence and that trust in the management, then they'll start opening up and, and telling more. So yeah, you've got to start at the top. Um, yeah, you asked me, how do we assess that trust? Well, there's lots of ways you can do it. You can send out surveys and things like that, which is often a knee jerk reaction for many organizations. The problem we find with that is that a lot of organizations get survey fatigue. Um, people often really don't design their surveys very well and often have 60 questions in it and it takes an hour to complete it. So what we often see is people start straight lining the answers. They've got multi choices and after a while it's yeah, yeah, mostly agree, mostly agree, mostly agree. And actually we end up with bad data uh, rather than rather than no data. And sometimes that's that's a worse situation. So yeah, what we what we tend to do is try to get out and speak to all parts of the companies. So as a consultancy, we, we would engage in what we call diagnostics. So we're going to study some of the behaviors. What are people doing? What are they reporting? Do they feel that they can openly report their errors? Let's have a look at some of the reports that you've conducted, so uh, that you've received. Let's look at some of the investigations you're doing. Are you doing investigations to look into the, the contributory factors behind errors? Um, and they're going out and chatting to staff, asking them if they trust their management and in what areas and do you report this issue and you know how you feel? Uh, and then also speaking to the management, what's your understanding of a just culture, um, which can be lightning, enlightening in itself? Yeah. Uh, and how would you deal with certain behaviours? All of that creates a big picture that can tell you something about an organisation. Culture is not something you very easily just go, ah, there, there it is. It, it's very complex and multifaceted. So you need to look at a lot of areas. So, so somebody who runs their own uh, sort of micro SME, I, I like, I would like to think that we um, that we're doing this this already. Um, but also, if I if I did have to monitor and change. It's going to be quite relatively easy for me because I've got a small number of staff. Um, to do this in a large organisation must be a challenge uh, uh, to to put it put it, put it put, uh, to put it nicely. Yeah, often with um, um, small organisations, it's very easily, particularly if it's the the leadership has owned the organisation, built the organisation from from its roots. They understand the DNA of the organisation. They understand the people they've brought in. The yeah. people that they recruited so actually you've got a pretty good grasp of, of the culture of the organization already and when you want to change something you've you've got a good understanding of if i press this button i know how these staff are going to respond and you know you, you, how to deal with them but when you get very large organizations i'm dealing with with two uh, at the moment um one in the united states of um over 100,000 staff uh, and another one uh, in the UK, um, slightly smaller than that, but still a, a big organisation. Uh, and things like the MOD um, that we've dealt with a lot in the past and, and the NHS, these are huge organisations. So it's not something that's very easy to do centrally. Um, it's something that centrally everybody needs to understand what is a just culture. But really, to make it work, you need to sort of filter it all the all the way down into various elements of the organisation, and and each sort of management group, so you sort of a devolving of responsibilities, and each management group needs to be able to understand and manage just culture themselves internally, but in in a consistent way across the whole of the organisation, um, uh, and. There are some psychologists who argue that actually just get rid of these sort of behavior flow charts and and things like that. And uh, it's something that we have and I've I've developed um, or continue to develop ourselves within Bain Simmons flow chart that we've got called Fur Three that you can download from our website. But there are lots of them or a few of them out there. And some psychologists say, oh, they're really bad. You just need to treat staff fairly. But as I said earlier, you know, one manager's fair is not necessarily another manager's fair. And uh, and if you just say that as a message, you end up with a rather inconsistent approach to just culture. And then the staff are not quite sure where they are. 
So having a process, explaining what the process is and showing staff and showing that with staff and they know how they'll be be judged should they make mistakes, errors or, or willfully violate, willfully break the rules, they know how they'll be treated. Uh, and I'll, I'll add a word of caution on that. Just because they've intentionally broken the rules doesn't necessarily mean that's bad. And we might want to talk about that in a bit more detail later. OK, so you mentioned a, um, a flowchart that you use. What are the sort of tools and techniques if, if you've, you've identified an organisation needs to or wants to change and, and has asked you, you've done your evaluation, said these are the sort of things that could change. What sort of standard tools and techniques do you use um, to, to help them on that journey? Well, one of the things that they need to to make sure that they they do have is make sure that there's this consistent process. So that even though I said um at the beginning that the process and, and paperwork doesn't do safety the people do is that we do need to be consistent in in how we deal with staff so the first thing that we really want to be looking at is where as an organization are you now where do you want to be and um to get there what would be the policy what, what would be how are we going to treat our staff in terms of a just culture so we're consistent so we would introduce things like our fur three potentially our fur three flow chart if they wanted to use it course they could do their own thing but we would talk them um, through the pros and cons and where they can make mistakes so it's about that consistent process um, uh, and then it's about um, really speaking with the leadership first it's really important you start at the top and not the bottom many organizations will come to us and say can you train our staff which is great we'll train train their shop floor staff their shop floor staff submit a report and their management haven't had the training yet and then punish them so what that does is instantly kill a just culture yeah. because the staff uh, and your reporting culture rather, because your staff now think, well, hang on a minute, you told us it was safe. We reported and we, we weren't safe. We got punished. So it's really important that you start at the top and work down uh, and really sort of the, the power empowering your system, giving your staff the ability to report is one of the last things you do. So starting at the top, making sure it's clear where you want to get to, making sure you've got clear, robust processes in place making sure that we've got a reporting mechanism that's effective so people can report and also making sure that we've got an investigation capability. So we really okay. look into why something has gone wrong. It's very easy to find out what happened and that's what many investigations go in and do and they just find out what happened um, and then tend to blame um, the last person holding the spanner or the last <laughs> pilot holding the controls, the old pilot lost situational awareness, which really doesn't stop another pilot losing situational awareness we need to understand why uh, and the modern day equivalent of that or the maintenance equivalent of that is the main tailor failed to follow failed to follow procedure yep great why we need to understand why they're not doing that um, otherwise it, you're really not getting rid of the problem you just blame that last maintainer or that last pilot so you need an effective investigation capability so people can dig down and understand those contributory factors and get away from thinking there's a single root cause, which uh, again is a, a bit of a bane of my life. The amount of organisations think for every accident there's a single root cause, which is a bit of a fallacy. It's, it's just a multitude of contributory factors. Yeah. So, so building those capabilities first is really what you need to have in place. So we, if somebody reports something, we can go and do the digging, we can find out why it's happening, and that we don't indiscriminately just jump straight to blaming people. And then when we understand that, it's about treating people fairly, because there may be some occasions where actually people are to be held to account. Uh, um, no, we haven't really talked about no blame cultures, but they're not good either. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, no blame cultures are not good because as a manager, you've got to you've kind of designed all your systems, assuming everybody's going to follow the pr procedures and processes. And um, many people think that if we go for a no blame culture, we'll have anarchy. People just do what they like because never, nobody's ever going to be held to account. But actually, the vast majority of staff are professional and they want to follow the procedures and they have professional pride and actually do still do a very good job. But for one of those one of those two minority people, um, they may be exposing your other staff to a dangerous situation if they're just doing whatever they like or perhaps your customers or, or people downstream. So we've got a duty of care as a manager to make sure that that we hold people to account so they don't endanger the system um, uh, and, their, and their colleagues. Um, but the other thing that tends to happen is that you tend to find that you, it's, a, it's really corrosive to morale if you go for no blame, 
because those professional colleagues start pointing the finger at those less professional colleagues and go, what are you doing about these guys? You know, they're getting away with it. So you get infighting amongst the staff and it also undermines management because management kind of lose credibility. Everybody goes, well, they're not dealing with it. Um, so so the staff start getting frustrated with, with the managers because it doesn't feel like management holding people to account. Okay. So so no blame can be just as bad as the blame culture. And this is why we've got to get this middle ground. This podcast is supported by K Sharp, the human science research and human factors consultancy. If you want to know how innovating in the relationship between humans and technology can add value to your business, product, or research, then visit www.ksharp.co.uk. You mentioned earlier um, that actually somebody intentionally doing something uh, yeah. might not actually be a bad thing. Um, can you uh, expand on that? Yeah, so again, often, and again, I was working with an airline um, actually immediately before the uh, uh, COVID hit us. And um, yeah, I remember going in there and, and a lot of the, their managers were, yeah, OK, if, if people are violating, if they're willfully breaking the rules, that's where we will punish them. Um, so I did. I said to them, so, so if your procedures are wrong and your staff are trying to follow it, and they can't follow the procedures in the real world because they've not been written in the real world or you can't do the job in accordance with those procedures. But you put pressure on the staff. They've got to complete it within a certain time frame. And they've come up with a really slick workaround. They're effectively breaking the rules because they're not following the procedure you wrote. So are you going to blame those staff or are you going to listen to those staff and find out why the procedure could be better? Or, or potentially your staff have not been given the appropriate tools to do the job and they're doing the best they can and this goes back to kind of your point uh you raising barry was um we, we don't want to just indiscriminately punish people people do safety not the procedures uh, and people are coming up with workarounds all the time they're finding where it's going wrong and they can tell you about it if you just give them the chance so yeah if we just indiscriminately blame them for for um for violating for breaking the procedures um that's not necessarily good because they'll just hide the behavior uh, so that's another thing that a lot of organizations think is we'll send them if we punish people we're sending a message to everybody else to comply with the rules but actually what we want them to do is, is tell us where the rules are wrong and encourage that that kind of behavior so where did this sit with a a whistleblowing policy for example because from what you're describing you kind of need you kind of want people to not only highlight what's wrong but also have the confidence to say i barry say that this is wrong and i have faith in in what's going on is there is there is there still a need for a whistleblowing policy type thing in there as well? Or yeah, again, I mean, it's very it's a, it's a key area to talk about, and um, I suppose we need to define exactly what whistleblowing is because what you're doing is by developing a just culture, you're giving your staff the opportunity to kind of blow the whistle internally. So you you yeah. can as a within the organisation, I've seen a problem. We're not doing things right. We've drifted away from the right way of doing things. Either we need to rewrite the way we do things, uh, or, or we've got to stop this behaviour in some way. So let's talk about it. So you're giving the opportunity to your staff to sort of internally whistle blow. And um, if staff still feel that you know they're not being treated fairly internally then i suppose the other definition of a whistleblowing policy is you know what i'm going to go to the regulator to talk about this yeah, yeah. which i suppose certainly in aviation is, is certainly in europe anyway not not so much in the us um, but certainly in europe is a regulated requirement we've got to have a just culture within aviation so people can put their hands up and say stop and uh, this isn't right and i can talk about where things are going wrong so theoretically yeah whistleblowing um policy still effectively exists is that we can go outside of our organization to talk about things that are not being uh done properly or, or perhaps we don't have a just culture which again through eu 376 2014 sorry for naming regulations but it rolls off the tongue really well <laughs> yeah yeah it's something i mention a lot certainly within <laughs> europe and uh copy straight across into the uk since since brexit is um, yeah, we, we have a duty to to implement in in aviation, less so in other industries, but the concept is getting there. So less regulated, but the concept is getting there. But I still think that whistleblowing policy is important. That 
if it's not been built within your organization, you still got that avenue to go outside, or perhaps it's not being correctly applied within your organization. You still got the avenue to go outside and raise your hand and say things aren't working properly here. James, this has been a really fascinating discussion. I want to thank you for your insight into, into this idea of the just culture. And, um, it certainly seems to be one of these things I think we could probably talk about it for another couple of hours and still only almost skim the surface in many ways. Um, you mentioned about, about um, having worked just before COVID. How have you found working during COVID? Have you, is it been a challenge? Well, it yeah, it, it's certainly a big change for us. Um, obviously, aviation has been very heavily hit, yeah. uh, which has been quite interesting because we've had approaches from other from other industries, um, maritime, healthcare, other organisations, which we've traditionally had less uh, engagement with. But uh, yeah, I think every industry has, has had a, a bit of a hit. Training budgets have diminished. But one of the things that we've we've done quite a lot internally, one thing that I'm finding I've done a lot in the last year is spend an awful lot of time on teams uh, and delivering training virtually. So talking with organizations, even doing a little bit of consulting virtually. Yeah. So, yeah, quite a, quite a significant change, but but one that's actually been really positive. And we found that we're bizarrely doing an awful lot of uh, engagements um, um, where traditionally would have had to fly out to New Zealand or America is that, you know, as long as we're managing, and I think um, one of my colleagues, Sarah, is going to talk to you on a future podcast, potentially about fatigue risk management. But uh, yeah, one thing that we've had to very carefully manage is um, is staff's time when we're working perhaps peculiar hours and delivering um, uh, training to uh, uh, people in very different time zones. So uh, yeah, something quite interesting. But uh, yeah, Teams has been a bit of a saviour and WebEx and all of those sort of platforms. It's been interesting, hasn't it? Because the in many ways, yes, you you can be you've had a really good excuse not to do all the travel and still deliver what you wanted to do. Um, but on the flip side as well, you seem to do meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting. Um, <laughs> yeah. so that whole um, you know going to the coffee bar and, and having a chat and a catch up with people and that whole um, re, or interrelationship that way has been a um, I, I really missed that. So I really enjoyed getting back to the office to get that bit. I think there's a challenge now to try and get that strike that right balance which um because i think there's um as much as i like teams and your zoom and, and all that sort of stuff that i certainly do get to the end of the day and just think oh uh, yeah uh, it's, it's quite nice to turn it off at the end of the day isn't it <laughs> <laughs> um so with, with all this said presumably you you've had to be doing a lot of work from, working from home as well to make that happen how have you found um, carving out that space for yourself um have you found that different or is it, was it okay yeah, it, it can be quite different, particularly um, prior to the pandemic. I'd spend an awful lot of time on the road dealing with a client directly. And then I would get in a car and I'd have a two, three hour drive home yeah. uh, or maybe even a flight home quite frequently work in different parts of the world. It's quite easy to sort of compartmentalize that and leave that behind. Obviously, when you're just stepping out of your office or your bedroom and going downstairs and, and picking the kids up from nursery or school or cooking dinner, it's very easy and tempting to wander back into the office and just finish yeah. something off. So, yeah, it's something I'm quite keen that I do at the end of the day is make sure I actually turn the laptop off, turn the laptop off and not just close it because yeah. it's very easy to reopen it and start re-engaging with it. So, yeah turn it off step away from it make sure i've wrapped up that piece of work and written notes to myself of where to pick up tomorrow uh, and that way it's a nice easy way to park it and, and yeah start thinking about other things and spending a lot more time in the gym than i've never done before um just to, to to get away and sort of um get your brain doing something else and engage with something else and, and stop sitting in a seat all day which is unusual <laughs> yeah no i think that idea about um switching the laptop off and writing yourself notes to so you can pick back up so you make your give yourself that transition and a, and a tool an aid memoir almost to, to get you going that's a fantastic idea and i'm going to steal that and, and use that <laughs> myself, um because i'm as guilty as anybody else of doing that um james it's been absolute pleasure to uh to chat to you thank you very much for taking the time to uh to talk to me today um as you said we are going to be talking to one of your colleagues as well in in, in a future episode I will be putting your um, your LinkedIn uh, link in the in the show notes. So anybody who wants to contact um, James to find out more about Just Culture or the work he does with uh, Bain Simmons, do drop him a line on on that. Also, I will put a link to the um, to the flowchart you mentioned on on the web on that's on the Bain Simmons website in the show notes, so people can get access to that. But for now, James, thank you very much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Barry.
been been lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us at www.barrykirby.co.uk and on Twitter at B-A-Z underscore K. See you next time. And remember, it's more than just common sense. Thank you for listening to 1202, the Human Factors Podcast. Please do get in touch with your thoughts, questions, and comments. You can contact us on social media such as Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook at 1202 Podcast. See you next time. And remember, it's more than just common sense.